Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about hot flashes, also called hot flushes. These signal the time around the menopause, the end of a woman's ability to reproduce, going to be suffered by 85% of all women going through that particular time. Seems like about one in three women are going to have at least 10 attacks a day. An attack is typically associated with feeling warm or hot, flushing of the skin, perspiration, oftentimes quite intense. Maybe it ends with a cold chill. Typically the symptoms last from one to five or 10 minutes, but can last as long as 60 minutes. If we look overall, there are about 40 million to 50 million women right now in those perimenopausal years, about another 10 million entering every single year, the hot flashes can significantly impair social activities. They can get in the way of work. They can impair the quality of life. And they're expensive. They're expensive because you see a healthcare worker, you get some medicine, you have to get some laboratory tests maybe, you have a side effect. Now most women think that it's the perimenopause when the symptoms begin, but in anywhere between 15 and 50 percent of women, the symptoms are going to begin while they're still having their normal periods, before they enter the perimenopause. So 15 to 50 percent before the perimenopause, during the perimenopausal years, 30 to 50 percent of the women are going to have the symptoms, after the menopause, in the early years after the menopause, still 30 to 80 percent of women going to have symptoms. So remember, 15 to 50 percent before the periods become abnormal, but during the perimenopausal years, the symptoms become more intense, more frequent, and more severe. They tend to be at their worst during the later part of the perimenopause, and then they taper off in the early postmenopausal years after they've been around for an average of about five years and interestingly symptoms of lesser intensity may last even longer. Now what's the likelihood you're going to see a doctor if you have these hot flashes? Well about 60 percent. They're just so bothersome. They take women to their health care providers, both hot flashes and the similar episodes that occur during the nighttime, night sweats, 70% of the women see the doctor because of that. 50% of the women see the doctor because of sleep disturbances or mood disturbances. So with the symptoms, you get this intense heat, daytime or nighttime. You get flushing of the ears, of the face, of the neck, of the chest, of the upper back, often associated with some anxiety and some palpitations. Symptoms are short duration, as I mentioned, and they vary in frequency. So the average number of attacks is about seven or eight a day. Some of them only occur occasionally, sometimes daily, sometimes hourly. Some poor women have up to 20 attacks a day. Not all women are created equally. If you weigh too much, you can't release the heat, so your symptoms are worse. If you happen to have a tendency toward either anxiety or depression, symptoms are going to be worse. And if you have a tendency toward emotional lability or embarrassment, symptoms are going to be worse. Well, while the age of onset can vary, the symptoms seem to be at their peak about a year before the last menstrual cycle. They can be uh, relatively short duration and last only for six months to a year or two. Average is about five years, but in one woman in four, the symptoms last between six and ten years. And unfortunately, in 10 or 15 percent of the women, the symptoms last from 10 to 30 years. The intensity can be either mild or moderate or severe. Not all are the same. And unfortunately, if they're severe, they tend to last for a longer period of time, more years. If they're mild, barely noticeable, last for less than five minutes and they don't interfere with your activities. In fact, they often pass unnoticed. If they're moderate in intensity, well, they're more frequent, they're noticeable, they're a little bit bothersome or mildly bothersome. You can even have an irregular heartbeat. But it's those severe attacks that are associated with reddening of the skin, with profuse perspiration, 
sometimes with a feeling of dizziness or a cold chill. Those are the ones that really are incapacitating. The average number per week, 35, 45. Now the symptoms are worse during what we call the perimenopause. That's called also the menopausal transition. It's the period of time leading up to your last menstrual cycle. The average duration of the perimenopause is about four years. And then you have the last period. That's called the menopause. But you can't diagnose the menopause. You can't say when the menopause is until you look backward because the definition of the menopause is the last menstrual cycle and you have not had a period for the next 12 months. So you have to wait at least a year to make the diagnosis of the menopause. What's the average age of the menopause? 51 in the United States right now averages anywhere between age 40 and age 58. The perimenopause, usually about 47 and a half. The symptoms aren't necessarily limited to just hot flashes, by the way. Sometimes women have genitourinary symptoms. Maybe they have some atrophy of the soft tissues of the genital tract. Maybe they have some dryness and sexual irritation, dysfunction. Maybe they have some sleep disturbances or some mood changes. A lot of other things have been said to be related to the menopause that really aren't. So the joint and the muscle problems, not related. The body composition changes, probably not related. Skin wrinkling, probably not related. And incontinence, probably not related. Now a hot flash occurs when your body has the need to suddenly dissipate heat. So what happens is your blood vessels dilate, they bring more blood to the surface of the skin so it can evaporate into the atmosphere. So obviously if it's hot, your body can't release the heat. If it's really humid, your body can't release the heat as much. So people who are in the summertime, people who are in the eastern part of the United States where the humidity is high, they have worse symptoms. Well, flushing, interestingly, is a situation where women feel self-conscious. They can feel themselves turn red. They believe they're red. They believe that people sitting across the table from them notice the redness. But that isn't necessarily the case. Even though you can feel hot and flushed, doesn't necessarily mean you look hot and flushed. So that's very important to realize. It's not a reason to be embarrassed. And additionally, when you have the symptoms, whether they're mild or moderate or intense, they tend to be stereotypic. So they tend, when they recur, to be the same as the episode before. And the next episode is going to be the same as this episode. By the way, they happen to be a little bit more common in Caucasian women and a little bit less frequent in Asian women. When the symptoms begin, they tend to become immediately severe. They don't linger for it. It's not a slow buildup. Once the symptom starts, it reaches maximum intensity in a matter of seconds, lasts for several minutes, then it improves. As I said, it gets worse in a hot room, worse in the summertime, worse with physical activity. Anything that takes your temperature up makes it worse. Sometimes all women have, instead of the hot flash, they have a chill instead. Well, a lot of women believe that the hot flashes at night, night sweats, are a cause of sleep disturbance. Well, in spite of all of the laboratory tests that have been done in all the sleep laboratories in this country and abroad, nobody's been able to find out what the relationship is, or even if a relationship exists. As a matter of fact, a lot of the scientific studies say there isn't any relation, but there really is, and the relationship has to do with what time of night it is. So if it's early in the evening, if it's in the first half of your sleep, it is found that you have a lighter sleep and when you perspire, when you have the hot flash, that oftentimes is enough to wake you up, even though a lot of women have hot flashes at night and sleep right through them. It's during the second half of the night when you have the REM sleep. Well, it seems that the REM sleep suppresses the area of the brain that's responsible for controlling the body temperature, and if you're going to have a hot flash in the second half of the night, it's not going to wake you up. You're already going to be awake, and then you have the hot flash. So hot flashes wake you up in the first half of the night, second half of the night you're up, and then you have the hot flash. 
Well, interestingly, the body has a circadian rhythm. And remember we said that the hotter you get, the more likely you are to have a hot flash. Well, your body's temperature peaks at somewhere around 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the evening. Fortunately, over the nighttime hours, your body temperature tends to go down. Interestingly, hot flashes don't necessarily signal the menopause. They can be the sign of a variety of conditions or even reactions to medicine. So, among the causes of hot flashes unrelated to the menopause are anxiety, overactive thyroid, hyperthyroidism, hypoglycemia, taking too much insulin or being diabetic and having those natural fluctuations or not having eaten enough for a while problem with the nerves and diabetes, certain infections or even new onset high blood pressure, certain autoimmune diseases, epilepsy, even eating too much Chinese food with that monosodium glutamate, taking a nitrate, a calcium blocker for your blood pressure, levodopa for your Parkinson's disease or if you're stressed out and you're popping your Zoloft or your Cymbalta or medicines like that, they can all cause hot flashes. So too can the anti-androgens medicines that are given specially to men with prostate cancer. So men, yes indeed, you can get hot flashes. Now why do people get hot flashes? So we know the demographics, but the question is why? Does it have something to do with estrogen? Yeah, but not really what you think. You see, your body has a core temperature. And just like everything else, it's regulated. You check your heart rate. And your heart rate is probably going to be pretty much the same when you're at rest throughout the course of the day and night. Well, same thing with your body temperature. Your body temperature is set and it has to stay in the zone. If it gets out of the zone, and we call that the thermoneutral zone, and if it's not in the thermoneutral zone, if it gets too high, then you perspire. If it gets too low, then you shiver. You feel a chill. And it's very important to realize that estrogen is somehow involved in the whole story because after all, it seems to be around the time of the menopause or the perimenopause when most women suffer their worst symptoms. But it's got more to do than with estrogen because after all, when you're five years old or six years old, you don't have a lot of estrogen floating around your system. And nobody's complaining about hot flashes at age five or six or seven. And actually, you don't get any more estrogen when you get to be 90, and there aren't 90-year-old women complaining about hot flashes. So there's something around the time of the menopause that seems to have something to do with the story. And estrogen, of course, has something to do, but exactly what we don't know. Here's the story. We think that estrogen, when it's there, impacts on the serotonin receptors in the brain, and they probably interact with some of the receptors for a substance known as noradrenaline, a relative of adrenaline. So it seems that if you get rid of the estrogen, then these other substances are going to become disrupted. And when they become disrupted, that's when you get the hot flashes. So if you get out of the thermoneutral zone, above it or below it, above it you have the flushing and the sweating, so that your, bo your body temperature can come back to normal. If it gets too low, you have the chill to get it back to normal. If you exercise, you're going to increase your body heat. And guess what? If you're a woman and if you have hot flashes and if your thermoneutral zone is now smaller, it's easier for you with just a little bit of exercise to make your body too hot and then you're going to start to perspire. You're going to have, in effect, a hot flash. Well, it's very important to realize that along with the hot flashes, because you're dilating the vessels, you're increasing the circulation, you can have a, an increase in your heart rate by about 7, 8, 9, 10, up to 15 beats a minute. Can we differentiate women with and without hot flashes on the basis of the estrogen concentration in their bloodstream or their plasma? or their urine, or their vaginal tissues? No, absolutely not. 
So it doesn't seem that we can pick out who's going to have the hot flashes depending on how much estrogen a woman has. And it also appears that we can give you a medicine that works on the noradrenaline and has nothing to do with the estrogen. We give you a medicine known as clonidine. And the clonidine oftentimes is going to be able to get rid of the hot flashes without changing the estrogen at all. But we know that estrogen is part of the story, as I mentioned before, because we know if a woman has a surgical procedure to remove the ovaries, typically the hysterectomy, well then that woman immediately is going to start suffering more frequent and worse hot flashes than a woman who goes through the menopause normally. And we also know that if a woman has breast cancer and we put the ovaries to rest, either medically with certain kinds of drugs that we have, or by means of chemotherapy or even just anti-estrogen therapy, that woman's probably going to have some pretty severe hot flashes. Tamoxifen, drug very frequently used for treatment of breast cancer, associated with hot flashes 60 to 70 percent of the time, and the aromatase inhibitors, Arimidex, Femora, those medicines, about 40, 50 percent, and even in men. If you're a man and you're being treated for prostate cancer, mm, chances are you're going to have hot flashes even though the estrogen content isn't really altered. Well, some people say that, look, if it's something to do with estrogen, you don't have any more estrogen, then maybe your brain, maybe that hypothalamus is telling your pituitary gland to make more of a chemical known as LH. LH comes out of the pituitary, goes down and tells the ovary, hey, make the estrogen. Maybe there is a pulse in that. Well, that's been studied and that has nothing to do with it. And some people think that it might have something to do with opioid receptors. And we do know that if you go and, at least in some people, get treatment with the medicines we use for opioid overdoses, Sometimes that's sufficient to bring down the hot flash. But interestingly, the whole story right now seems to revolve around noradrenaline or norepinephrine. We use the medicine called clonidine. We can decrease the amount of norepinephrine and in many women we can improve the hot flashes or get rid of them. Now, why? Because it seems that the noradrenaline, when it's floating around in the brain, it has a tendency to shrink that thermoneutral zone. And it seems like the clonidine goes and opens up that thermoneutral zone. So instead of being almost nil, now we can get a quarter to a half a degree. And that seems to be very important. Now, to test the theory, there's a herb called Johannbein. Johannbein is typically used over the counter to treat erectile dysfunction or to help burn fat. And if you take it, what it does is it increases the amount of noradrenaline system and causes hot flashes. It causes hot flashes only in those women who are prone to hot flashes. Clonidine, on the other hand, a chemical that goes and lowers the effective level of noradrenaline in the system, that might just treat hot flashes, at least in some women. So now you know the story about who gets it and why the question is, how do we treat it? You tune in for the next video, and I'll tell you. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.